Hello, I'm Dr. Ankita Jha, junior resident at Krishna Vishwa Vidya Peet, and I am here to have a paper presentation on ultrasound characterization of salivary gland lesions. The development of high-frequency, high-resolution linear transducers as a result of advancement in ultrasound technology transformed imaging of superficial structures. Ultrasound can be used to examine most cases that present to the clinicians in their daily practice as neck or facial lumps, and it can also aid in the imaging of salivary gland abnormalities. Our ability to make a solid diagnosis in this study was aided by the lesion's morphological characteristic on ultrasound and the age of clinical presentation. The aim and objective of the study was to evaluate the role of ultrasound in detection and characterization of salivary gland lesions. A total of 100 patients were evaluated with suspected and unsuspected salivary gland lesions. The patient were examined on GE Logic P9 color Doppler system with a high-frequency linear array probe. Ultrasound was performed in longitudinal and transverse axis with the help of the high-frequency probe after clinically evaluating for the patient's chief complaints. Starting with the different cases that we have seen, the first case is a 15-year-old female with history of painful swelling of bilateral parotid gland which increased after eating. On longitudinal study of the uh, parotid gland, we could see that it appears enlarged and there was few hypoechoic linear uh, striations inside and generalized fat surrounding around the parotid gland as well as the submandibular gland. This was indicated of a viral inflammation of the parotid. Here we have a 40-year-old female with recurrent bouts of swelling over the left parotid region. An image C shows diffusely swollen parotid gland with parenchymal cysts and surrounding fat stranding showing multiple calcific foci within. This was suggestive of a chronic parenchymal inflammation. In this case, we have a 45-year-old male patient with history of painful swelling of the left parotid gland with on and off history of fever. On longitudinal sonography, the affected parotid gland appeared enlarged and showed multiple hypochoic pockets uh, within. And uh, there was increased vascularity on color Doppler studies. In images D and E as described, this was indicative of multiple microapsis of the parotid gland. Here we have a 30-year-old male patient showing uh, with a history of uh, uh, painful swelling of the right parotid gland with recurrent history of fever. On ultrasound, we could see that the affected parotid gland appears hyperechoic, enlarged, and showed multiple small hyperechoic uh, circular oval lesions with a fatty hilum uh, within. And it appeared maintained and showed vascularity on color Doppler studies. This was indicative of an intraparotid lymphadenopathy. In another case, we had a patient with a history of lump in the right sublingual region since three months. And on ultrasound, we could see an ill-defined heterochoic predominantly hyperchoic area in the right sublingual gland and uh, an enlarged uh, reactive lymph node adjacent to it. On further evaluation, we could also see that the retromandibular vein and the facial vein appeared dilated, showing echogenic content within with positive of color on color Doppler studies. All of these features were indicative of a thrombus secondary to the salidinitis within the gland. Moving on to the next cases, we had a patient come with history of tenderness and swelling over the right parotid region with occasional episodes of fever. Here we can see the enlarged parotid gland showing hypochoic areas of necrosis within and it appears ill-marginated, showing peripheral vascularity on color Doppler studies. This is further explained on this video. We can see the ill-marginated hypochoic area within the gland. All of these were suggestive of early abscess formation. Here we have a patient with a history of tenderness and swelling over the right submandibular region with on and off episodes of fever. On B mode of uh, ultrasound, we could see that the parotid gland actually was enlarged with hyperchoic areas within and an enlarged cervical lymph node with maintained fatty hilum uh, adjacent to the, uh, lymph, uh, the gland, probably because of the reactive inflammation. And this was suggestive of an early abscess formation. Here we have a 30-year-old male who had uh, complaints of tenderness over the right lateral aspect of neck with dysphagia and fever. And on ultrasound, we could see that the Walton's duct appears dilated, showing a hyperechoic linear structure, giving posterior caustic shadow within. This was suggestive of a submandibular calculus. Similar linear hyperechoic structures were noted in the sublingual region, giving posterior caustic shadowing and a dilated duct within the gland, uh, giving rise to a sublingual calculus. Here we have a 25-year-old male patient who had come to ENT with history of recurrent painful swelling over the lateral aspect of the neck and associated difficulty in swallowing. In image A, we can see a linear hyperechoic structure giving the posterior caustic shadow within the dilated, dilated duct, which is indicative of a calculus. But uh, what we can see is in image B, that is the adjacent parenchyma of the gland, appears a hypoechoic uh, 
probably because of the concomitant inflammation arising from the calculus. In image C, we can see uh, have, we have a dilated duct with debris within, indicative of a radio loose in calculus. Here we have a 25-year-old male patient who came with history of painful swelling over the left submandibular region below the angle of mandible. And uh, there was a history of swallowing of a fish bone while eating three days back. However, the patient said that the fish bone did not come out. On ultrasound, we could see in image A here, a linear hyperechoic structure within the gland and adjacent parenchyma shows mild inflammatory changes. Few subcentimetric cervical lymph nodes were noted surrounding the gland. All of these are suggestive of foreign body and its related inflammatory changes. The patient underwent left submandibular gland excision and it was concluded to be a fish bone. Here we can see the uh, foreign body and the lymph node next to it here. Now we had a patient with complaints of dry eyes and mouth with bilateral parotid swelling. On B mode ultrasound, we could see that the parotid and submandibular glands showed multiple small hypochoic uh, areas within and the thyroid gland appeared atrophic. However, there were no evidence of calcification within the glands. These are consistent with intermediate stage of Sjogren's disease. Here we have a 35-year-old male patient with a history of painless mobile lump over the right lateral part of the neck since two years. On grayscale ultrasound, we can see a well-defined anechoic avascular lesion uh, showing posterior caustic enhancement, which is indicative of a ranula. Another patient with a history of mild painful swelling, oh, which was slowly increasing in size uh, with no history of fever in the sublingual region. On ultrasound, we could see a multilocular tubular cystic structure in the left sub -gland, uh, sublingual gland, and it was also seen extending to the submandibular region. There were few hyperechoic foci within this uh, but there was no solid component or vascularity on color Doppler studies. This was indicative of a plunging ranula. Here we have a 40-year-old male patient who had a uh, swelling over the right parotid region after some dental work. On examination, multiple cervical lymph nodes were palpable and the patient was subsequently tested and found to be HIV positive. On ultrasound, a unilocular cyst was noted in the superficial part of the parotid with settled debris in the dependent portion. These features were suggestive of a lymphoepithelial cyst. Here we have a 45-year-old female who came with swelling in the left preauricular region. It was a solitary mobile, non-tender swelling that gradually increased in size over six months. On investigation, the patient had hyperglycemia and had a megaloblastic anemic picture. On ultrasound, we could see the enlarged hyperechoic salivary gland with poorly visible deep lobe without any focal lesion or increased blood flow, which indicated a benign uh, salivary gland lesion. FNAC was performed and it was concluded to be a silosis. This was an incidental finding as the patient had come for USG neck for evaluation of dysphagia, where we could see the right submandibular gland could not be appreciated, indicative of agenesis, whereas the left submandibular gland appeared normal, showing compensatory hypertrophy. Here we have a 75-year-old male patient who was a known case of CA of the parotid gland and uh, he, uh, had, he had undergone radiation therapy and would come for regular follow-up. He was advised for ultrasound this time and we could see the affected parotid gland appearing smaller in size, showing loss of normal architecture with reduced thickness, which was due to post-radiation atrophy. Here we have a 30-year-old male patient who came with painless swelling of the left parotid region since five years with no history of sinus or discharge. On the longitudinal section of the parotid gland, we can see an oval hyperechoic lesion with the linear hyperechoic structures within, which is indicative of a subcapsular lipoma. In image B, we can see that there is a, a well-defined lesion with similar characteristic as mentioned in image A, but this is further within the parenchyma, indicative of an intraparenchymal lipoma. Here we have a 30-year-old patient who had a mobile lump in the right parotid region since five years with no history of sinus or discharge. On longitudinal section of the ultrasound, we can see a well-defined oval heterochoic lesion with a sharp margin in the subcutaneous plane and it is seen pushing the parotid inferiorly, which is indicative of a pre-auricular pre region dermoid or epidermoid cyst. Here we have a 40-year-old female with complaints of a painless lump over the right angle of the mandible. On ultrasound, we can see here in image A that it is a well-defined hypochoic lobulated lesion with distinct borders giving posterior acoustic enhancement in the parotid gland. And on color Doppler's images, we can see that there is increased vascularity surrounding the lesion. This is a typical appearance of a pleomorphic adenoma. Here we have a 60-year-old male patient with complaints of painless lump over bilateral parotid region. Image A shows the left parotid and image B shows the right parotid. So in image A, we can see that there is a sharp marginated lesion in the left parotid with hypoechoic 
cystic areas within. And it is giving us a typical posterior acoustic enhancement. And on the right parotid, we can see a similar cystic, solid cystic lesion within. And this is hypervascular on color Doppler studies. All of these features are indicative of bilateral war thin tumor. Coming to the next case, we have a 65-year-old male patient who came to the OMFS OPD with a history of painful lump in the pre-auricular region. And it was associated with Christmas since six months, and he was advised for ultrasound. On ultrasound, we can see a homogeneous mass enlarging, replacing most of the parenchyma, showing internal septations, lobulations, and hypervascularity on color Doppler studies. The patient underwent parodidectomy, and on histopathology, we could see that it was a mucoepidermal carcinoma. We have a similar case with a 65-year-old patient who came with a history of painful lump and Christmas in six months. And uh, on ultrasound, we could see a solid cystic lesion replacing most of the parenchyma of the parotid gland and uh, showing a few necrotic areas within and appearing hypervascular on color Doppler studies. He underwent a superficial parotidectomy and on histopathology, we could uh, determine that it was an adenoid cystic carcinoma. Concluding this study, Ultrasound is an effective and practical technique for diagnosing disorders of the salivary gland. It not only makes it possible to confirm or rule out the existence of a mass, but also on the basis of the ultrasound findings, the nature of the underlying disease may be frequently inferred. Using a high-resolution, high-frequency linear ultrasound imaging facilities, the assessment of the salivary gland uh, morphology um, uh, aids in the routine clinical settings. A useful initial assessment for seeing salivary gland cancers is sonography. When sonography is unable to fully define a lesion, we should obviously opt for CT and MRI for further evaluation. Sonography is useful in confirming or ruling out abscess selectasia in cases of acute inflammation. It is usually the method of choice for diagnosing calculi and is better than plain films as it can also visualize non-opaque calculi. Moreover, sonographic definition of the precise location is also possible. In our study, sonography not only identified advanced cases of autoimmune diseases, as well as the persistent chronic inflammatory changes in salivary glands. In this study, as we can give a pictorial representation, most commonly presented conditions were acute cases of inflammation, followed by benign tumors of the salivary gland and silolithiasis. These are my references. Thank you.